Okay, we were in Act 1, Scene 1, I believe on page 1210 of Bevington. <clears throat> and we were in the process of Kent kind of upbraiding um, Lear. And he says, I'm going to actually back us up to the beginning of that speech by Kent on page 1209. Uh, begins with line 144. Act 1, scene 1, line 144. Let it fall, rather, though the fork conveyed the region of my art. Be Kent unmannerly when Lear is mad, not angry, he means crazy. <coughs> what wouldst thou do, old man? He calls him old man because, one, he already realizes Lear is lunatic, okay? But he's trying to prod him even more. He's just going to, you know, keep sticking him, as it were. <coughs> thinks, that that, thinks thou that duty shall have dread to speak when, flat, when power to flattery bows, to plainness honors bound when majesty falls to folly, to plainness. No more flowery speech, no more sugared words. I'm going to speak bluntly and openly. Why? Because your majesty has been reduced to folly, to foolishness. Reserve thy state. What's he mean by reserve? Hold back. Take it back. Thy state? You're thinking the more modern notion of state. state that is, the country. Close. What's Lear's natural state? Think great chain of being. King. Reserve thy state, thy what? Thy kingship. Take it back. Why? What does he have without it? Nothing. Okay? So, reserve thy state. <coughs> da, 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 da. And in thy best consideration, check this hideous rashness. Best consideration. Best thought. Do what? He's using check in the sense of the American form of government made up of checks and balances. Check what? This hideous rashness. Why hideous? What is something that is hideous? Ugly? What else? Hard to look at. Hard to look at? Malformed? Is rashness ever not hideous? Is rashness just <laughs> flying off at the handle? Is that ever appropriate? No, it's not. Why? It lacks reason. Rashness always lacks reason. Okay? Answer my life, my judgment. That is, take my judgment of you, and if I'm wrong, take my life. That's Polonius saying, if I've ever been wrong, take this from this. Okay? Thy youngest daughter does not love thee least. That's the judgment that he's saying, if I'm wrong, kill me. Nor are those empty hearted whose low sounds revert no holiness. Yeah, Ben. What, what is Kent's motivation to just like reprimand the king here? Like what, what, where's he coming from? Like, Anybody? Why does Kent do this? Going to be banished very shortly, or already has been. Kent is. Yeah. Do we learn that? Oh, okay. That's yeah, I mean it's it's um. Because I thought he just banished the daughter. Is the is. Line one seventy six. Five days we do allot thee for provision to shield thee from disasters of the world, on on and on the sixth to turn thy hated back upon our kingdom. Okay, so. He's about to banish Kent. He hasn't yet. 
but he has already, um, when Kit says, Royal Lear, whom I have ever honored as my king, etc., etc., loved as my father, he says, the bow is bent and drawn. In other words, come on, yeah. let me have it. So, why is Kent doing this? What's his purpose? Let's try to, let's go to purpose first. <coughs> what's he told Kit, what's he told Lear he wants Lear to do? Take it back. Is it strictly like patriotism, if, for lack of a better word? Like he's just trying to save the kingdom, he thinks Lear's ruined. No, I don't think it's that at all, actually. Yeah. I don't, I don't think Kent, That's a very strictly like speaking, cares about the kingdom. It's the first part of that word. It's about the king. It's about the king. So he's willing to like risk his like well being just to help. Why? This gets more at the heart of your question. Why? Because there's something about a king. Okay? Later on, we're gonna see Kent join up with Lear, and he's gonna go by the name Keys. Okay, or a gentleman. And Lear doesn't recognize him. And Lear's going to ask him, why would you serve me? And he says, there's something about you, the hint of majesty. Okay? And in doing that, Shakespeare is saying, Shakespeare is suggesting that monarchs have an innate thing about them that says they have the grace of God to rule. And it can't be what? It, like this shirt. It can't be taken off and given to somebody else. See, in that, that whole tradition of inheritance, primogenitor, and all that kind of stuff, you couldn't abdicate. I mean, England went through a quote-unquote constitutional crisis in the second quarter of the 20th century. Why? Because King Edward VII okay, fell in love with an American divorcee named Wallace Simpson. And the English Constitution forbids marriage to a divorcee. Could not happen. Okay. This isn't about 19... 36, 37, if I remember correctly. He's been carrying on with her for a while. Everybody knew. That is, everybody, the royalty, the aristocracy, and everybody. Because it was in the papers. And Wallace Simpson was not this um, demure, let's keep it in the shadows. Kind of, she was very ostentatious. Okay? In her living and in her public affection for the king and such. Um, and it finally came to a head where the king was forced to break it off. You have to break it off. Okay? And he said, no, I can't. I choose love. Okay? And he chose Wallace Simpson and abdicated. It's the first real abdication. I mean, real it's not like when, when um, James II flees England and goes to France because Parliament has invited in William of Orange and his wife Mary. I mean, that was a quote-unquote abdication because he thought he was going to die. This was an abdication, but the Duke of Windsor, as he later became, realized, I'm not going to die, I'm going to go on. And he did. He went on and he didn't die until, that, if I remember correctly, Till the seventies or so. Okay, he was always kind of there in the background. Okay, and England had a you know a bit of a difficult relationship with him. So Kent is here essentially. He's it's it's not even just the king himself. What do we talk about in the United States since we don't have a monarchy? It's what? It's the office. Of the presidency. <coughs> I heard an interview the other day about the whole Jim Acosta, you know, press flare up and everything. And the interview was with another uh, journalist, another correspondent, who was at another press um, 
thing out in the Rose Garden or something. And the White House intern handed him the microphone. And so he thought, yeah, I can have questions. You know? This guy's a major correspondent. I don't, he, actually, I think he's one of the best um, reporters there is out here, Major Garrett. And he got ready to ask his question. He started, and Trump said, no, no, not you. And he was pointing to the person behind him. He goes, oh. And turned around and hand the mic back. And he said, and I did that for two reasons at least. One, the American people chose this person as president. I respect the choice of the American people. He might not dis he might not agree with it. I don't know what his politics are. He might not agree with it. But they chose. And that person who has that office gets to say, I want you to ask a question, and 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 I don't want to hear from the rest of you. Period. And he said, because I so respect that office. Now, a lot of my colleagues were probably thinking, you rolled over. Why didn't you just ask your question? And he said, because it wasn't my turn. That is, I, you know, the guy in orange, I might not respect, but he has that office. Kent is standing up for the office of the monarchy. Because he knows what's going to happen. That is, as Hamlet would say, you know, oh, my prophetic soul. I think Kent kind of has a prophetic soul, too. He realizes if you take that great chain of being and you lop off the head, which is what the king is in human society, what's going to happen? Everything else is going to go out of whack. As we will hear discussion in this play. Okay? So, Kent, on, no, on thy life, you say one more word and you're dead, man. My life I never held but as a pawn to wage against thine enemies. What's he mean? I am your servant. I am, it's more than your servant. I am your foot soldier. That is, you can waste my life in battle. Nor do I fear to lose it. Thy safety being motive. That is, I'll lose my life for this, for this fight. It's it's a it's an even even exchange. Out of my sight, see better, Lear. I, I mean that's very Sophoclean. I mean that's right out of Oedipus. See better, Lear, and let me still remain the true blank of thine eye. Look at your gloss. The means to enable you to see better. Blank means the white center of the target, or the true direct aim. In other words, turn all your hatred where? On me. So it's not directed where? Cordelia. On Cordelia. What about the contradiction that he respects the office so much that he's calling him old man and Lear to his face? Anybody? Is it a contradiction, first of all? What's he trying to get, again, what's he trying to get Lear to do? Hatred to him and not to someone. Okay, true. He's trying to get him to act like him. Yes. He's trying to get Lear. Provoke him? Yeah, to prov almost to provoke him back to sanity. To provoke him to act correctly. Problem with that? If somebody's already crazy... And you provoke them, you're just going to make them a little crazier. Okay? So, see better means what? As it is, Lear's eye is distracted. There's that word again. Distracted means what? Drawn away. Okay? He's not seeing properly. So, Kent is trying to get his prescription right. Now, by Apollo... Yeah, swear by thy gods in vain. Why? Because the gods aren't real? No, not necessarily. It's the chain of being. Keep going. So you're exactly right. You break the chain of being. You're a part of it. You then can't be like, oh, hey, chain of being. <laughs> you're going against the gods, Lear. Yeah. 
It's the gods that set that whole chain of being. You know, if you're taking the chain of being out of the Christian context, because you can move it around, okay? If you're taking it out of the Christian context and putting it in the pantheon context, then the gods are above that, and the gods determine that chain. So don't go swearing by the gods. It'd be like an atheist saying, by God, I'm really, I mean, come on. O vassal miscreant. Miscreant. What does it literally mean? Miscreated. <coughs> You're not what you were intended to be. Albany, Cornwall. Forbear, why? Because Lear puts his hand on his sword like, I'm going to. Now, are Albany and Cornwall, are they defending Kent? No, they're trying to calm Lear down. Kill thy physician. That is, I'm your healer, Kent, uh, Lear, and the fee bestow upon the foul disease. So, kill me, and the fee, what's the fee? The cause is what? Your madness. Same idea as we saw in Hamlet. Was it, met, was it Hamlet that wronged Laertes? No, never. I ever did love thee. It was what? My madness. Therefore, don't blame me. Kent to say, and if he does this, if he kills me, don't hold it against him. It's his madness that does this. <laughs> or, so, revoke thy gift. What gift? Did he, give, give, did he give a gift to Kent silently that we're unaware of? It's the division of the kingdoms. Of the kingdom. Take it back. Or whilst I can vent clamor from my throat, that is, as long as I'm breathing, I'll tell thee, thou dost evil. Hear me recreant on thine allegiance that is you swore allegiance to me you say you serve me okay then hear me that thou hast sought to make us break our vows which we durst never yet durst never yet I've never broken a vow and with strained pride to come betwixt our sentence and our power well what's the difference between our sentence and our power, our judgment, and what's the power part? The ability to enforce it. Right? The ability to enforce it. Right? The legislative makes laws. The judiciary determines whether or not those laws are constitutional. What's the other branch of government? The executive. And what does it do? It executes. That is, it carries out the laws. So, don't get between my judgment and my execution of that judgment. Which nor our nature nor our place can bear. Look at your gloss. Which neither my temperament, my nature, nor my office as king can bear. Well, what's the problem there? Okay. True. But the problem's even more basic than that. It goes back even further than that. What has Lear already done? He's given up the kingship. He's not king anymore. I mean, we could go back to the lines... Where he says, we have divided in three our kingdom, and tis our fast intent to shake all care and business from our age. He's already divided it. He's already shaken all care and business. So this is like Obama, January 21st, 2016. No power. He doesn't have any power anymore. The only power he has is the power the others kind of go along with. 
I mean, Kent could challenge him at this point. He could say, you're not king, old man. But he doesn't. Why? Because he respects the power, the office of the king. And in Kent's mind, no matter what Lear says about giving up the kingship, he can't. He is still the rightful king. If Kent had been around at the end of Richard II, what would Kent have said to Henry Bolingbroke? Notice, I did not call him Henry IV. That you're not king. You're not king. You can't take it. All right? So, don't become between our power nor our place we can bear. Our potency made good, that is, our power made good. Take thy reward. Here's what you get for smart and optimist. Five days we do a lot deeper provision to shield thee from disasters of the world. And, well, that's generous of them. That is, pack up your van. Why? Because it might be hard out there. A little bit of foreshadowing, by the way, for Act 3. <clears throat> and on the sixth to turn thy hated back upon our kingdom. If on the tenth day following thy banished trunk be found in our dominions, the moment is thy death. By Jupiter, this shall not be revoked. Why by Jupiter? Who's Jupiter? King of the gods. Jupiter is Roman Zeus. Okay. Is there a reason for the jumping back and forth between Rome and Greece? Or is it just... I don't think so. I think Shakespeare's just, you know, kind of throwing the, all, all the pantheons together. Mm -hmm. So, fare thee well, king, Sith, since thus thou wilt appear. Wilt. Does that mean, since you desire to appear like this, freedom lives hence and banishment is here. How can freedom be out there and banishment be here? <coughs> Well, where is here? What's he saying? Since you will appear thus, to be with the king is banishment. To be somewhere else is freedom. Why? Because the king's not himself. So to be in the king's presence is to be banished from the king. Since the king is not himself. Freedom lives hence in banishment is there. He then speaks to Cordelia. The gods to their dear shelter take thee maid going to be kind of an interesting question how quote unquote loving or sheltering are the gods because we're going to have a great little zinger from Gloucester towards the end of Act 3 about the gods and flies that justly thinks and has most rightly said justly you think rightly Kent says Justly, it's appropriate. You should love your father how you do, so that when you get married, you can love your husband how you say you will. And then he speaks to Gonroll and Reagan. In your large speeches, may your deeds approve. Large. How are the speeches large? Oh, Daddy, I love you this much. Okay, so what's Kent saying? Prove it. <clears throat> Prove it. Let your deeds equal your act, uh, equal your words. That good effects may spring from words of love. Why? Because words of love should produce good effects. If the motivation really is love, then the consequences really should be good. That is morally good. Thus Canto Princes bid you all adieu. He'll shape his old course in a country new. Okay? So Gloucester introduces France and Burgundy. 
And Burgundy says, well, what does she bring with her to the deal? And Lear says, nothing. And he says, thank you very much. I'll collect my things. And France says something different. Cordelia, top of 220, uh, line 227, top of page 1211, says, well, let me back up. France says 217. This is most strange. That she who even but now was your best object. The argument of your praise, balm of your age, the best, the dearest, should in this trice of time commit a thing so monstrous to dismantle so many folds of favor. What's France saying? What the hell has Cordelia done? I mean, this must be really bad. Okay. Why? Because she was your best object. She was the argument that is when Lear would issue praise, Cordelia was the theme every time. So, what'd she do? And Cordelia, uh, your majesty, please, can, 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 can I speak here and can you please tell him honestly what I did? Why? I never yet, I yet beseech your majesty, line 228, if for, that is because, I want, that is I lack, that glib and oily art to speak and purpose not. I don't have the ability to speak what I do not mean. She would not make a good lawyer. Why? I don't mean that, you know, facetiously, and I don't mean it ne necessarily pejoratively. Lawyers have got to be able to do what? Okay, I, I get what you mean, but I disagree with the twist the words to your purpose. Lawyers have got to be able to argue both sides of a case. She can't turn those down to argue. Okay. She can't argue a side that she doesn't herself. Exactly. She can't argue a point she doesn't believe. She would not make a good politician. Why? Because politicians, if this is one audience, they do what? They say something that appeals to that audience. Well, here's a different audience. They might not agree with that audience. So, change my words a bit. So, notice, she calls that a glib and oily art. It's the art of rhetoric. It's the art of massaging your words, your logic, to suit whatever purpose. If you're going to be a good debater, you've got to be able to take a stand on any position. That is, even one you might disagree with. So, since what I will intend, I'll do it before I speak. I'll do it. That is, I show it how in my actions. If she were a leader, she would not be a leader by word alone. She would lead how? By example. Okay. That you make known it is no vicious plot. So what does she mean by vicious plot? You know, some murder or foulness. No unchaste action. I've not been running down to the brothels. Or dishonored step that have deprived me of your... Grace and favor. Would, would you please tell Mr. France, you know, I've not been sleeping around the block. I've not been doing these horrible things. Uh, would you just tell him that I didn't flatter you, please? That's what she's asking Lear to do. Better thou hadst not been born than not to have pleased me. What does this tell us about Lear? Okay. Vain doesn't go far enough. Keep going. 
He's a narcissistic narcissist. Okay? I mean, <coughs> wow. Friends, that's all? Is it but this? That's it? A tardiness in nature which often leaves the history unspoke that it intends to do? You sure, Burgundy? You don't want her. Love's not love when it is mingled with regards that stands aloof from the entire point. What? What the hell's he talking about? Love's not love that stands, that, that when it is mingled with regards that stands aloof from the entire point. Well, you've got a gloss, regards point, irrelevant considerations. What is France saying are the irrelevant considerations? No. That was a good guess because of what's been talked about. What are the irrelevant considerations in terms of Cordelia's hand? The dowry. She is the entire point to France. Not Burgundy. Burgundy wants the land. France wants the body. <laughs> the person. Will you have her? Uh, give her the portion you proposed, royal king, and then I'll take her. King, nothing. Nope, she's yours. France, France, fairest Cordelia that art most rich, being poor. Oxymoron, right? That is, it's something that appears to be contradictory, but upon closer examination, you can see the truth of it. Most choice forsaken. Well, she's most choice to whom? France. Forsaken by Lear. And most loved by France. Despised by Lear. Why? France sees correctly. Lear isn't blind. He doesn't see properly. It's even worse than being blind. He sees things not as they are. So, thee and thy virtues, here I seize upon. Burgundy sitting off to the side goes, virtues? What the hell are you talking about? She doesn't have any virtues. Because virtues to him means dollar signs. <coughs> or land, you know. Be it lawful, I take up what's cast away. Takes her hand. Gods, gods. Tis strange that from their colds neglect my love should kindle to inflame respect. Thy dowerless daughter, king, thrown to my chance, is queen of us. Just put her on that pedestal. Of ours, that is, all my subjects, and our fair friends. That's, they were just married, by the way. <laughs> kind of a common law marriage, you know. Not all the dukes of Watrish Burgundy can buy this unprized precious maid of me. Bid them farewell, Cordelia, though unkind. Thou losest here a better where to find. You lose here where the king is. Why? Because you're going to find a better where, where in France. So Lear essentially says, see you, France. <laughs> so Cordelia bids farewell to her sisters. Ye jewels of our father. Why does she call him that? What do jewels tend to do to the eyes? They sparkle. Look at, you know, Grammy Awards, Academy Awards, and not the actors, but the actresses. Yeah, I'm going to use some of that. You know, what are half the newspaper articles about? What they wore, and it's not just the gowns, it's the bling. Who borrowed, you know, diamonds, whatever, from wherever, okay? They are the jewels, that is, ooh, sparkly, in Lear's eye. So, with washed eyes, Cordelia loves you. Washed? She's weeping. 
She's weeping. She should be weeping. She doesn't want to leave, but she has to leave. Let me rephrase that. It's not that she doesn't want to leave because she doesn't love France. It's that she doesn't want to leave and she's weeping because she knows what her sisters are capable of. And she loves her father. And she ought to. And she knows her sisters don't give a rat's you know what. She thinks of her sisters as Hamlet thinks of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Adder's fanged. I almost said fatter's end. <laughs> and according to herself, she's leaving half of her love life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she's kind of like <laughs> giving half of her heart to her, leaving it behind. I know you what you are. Notice she doesn't say, I doubt you, that is, I expect, or I think I, I know you too. And like a sister, I'm most loath to call your faults as they are named, that is, and I won't talk about this in public. Love well our Father to your professed bosoms. Professed means what? When you profess something, speak. you speak it loudly. A professor is one who speaks loudly. Now, I know, I've been by classes, you know, and everybody's asleep. Because, you know, somebody speaking a little timid voice like this, and they never vary their intonation ever. No. To your professed bosoms, I commit him. Commit, that is, I trust, but... I don't know if in Shakespeare's day it also had the other sense of like when we commit someone. Okay? Because they did have an insane asylum known as the Hospital Bethlehem, which had the nickname Bedlam because of how it was pronounced. The Beth became bed and lem. Okay? The internal um, syllable dropped off. So. But yet, alas, stood I within his grace, I would prefer him to a better place. If he still looked rightly upon me, I, I, I would prefer to put him somewhere else. <laughs> like where? Right beside me. Because she loves him. This is the kind of daughter who will what? Ooh, I never thought about that. I think it's probably safe to say Lear could be suffering from a disease that is becoming, apparently, more rampant in our population. Why? Because our population is getting older and older. Alzheimer's. My mom died of Alzheimer's a couple years ago. What does Alzheimer's do? It removes your sanity. doesn't make everybody crazy, but it makes them forget things that makes them do things they normally wouldn't do. She is the dutiful daughter who will what? Not put dad in some home, but take care of her in her own home. Reagan, prescribe not us our duty. Don't tell us what to do. Goneril, let your study be to content your Lord. That is, please your husband who hath received you at fortune's alms. Who hath received you what? <laughs> yeah. When you are down here at the bottom of fortune's wheel, because you're poor, you're destitute. Right? How's it better to be received? Is it better to, to be received at fortune's alms? Or do you want to be chosen because of your bank account? Where's true love, you know, as it were. So, time shall unfold what plighted cunning hides. Who covers faults at last shame, then derides. Well, may you prosper. In other words, kind of like, it's almost like she's saying, God be with you. <laughs> or the gods be with you. So, France and Cordelia leave. And we have Goneril and Reagan. And Goneril says, about 293, 292, excuse me. You see how full of changes his age is. Notice, 
changes. What's that imply? This isn't the only stupid thing Lear's done. This is just the latest stupid thing. That's what she means by changes. The observation we have made of it hath not been little. That is, we've seen this coming. We've seen these changes, these differences in dead. And we've been noting it. He always loved our sister most. He always loved Cordelia most, and with what poor judgment he hath now cast her off appears too grossly. That is, the poor judgment is too readily apparent. Even Goneril and Reagan acknowledge it. What are they saying? I'm in your right mind. Tis the infirmity of his age, Reagan says. Well, that's what happens to all old people. They, they lose their wits. Not true. How do I know? Because of the next statement Reagan makes. Yet he hath ever but slenderly known himself. Talked here before about the Oracle of Delphi that had a plaque out in front and inscribed on that plaque Two words. Know thyself. Reagan says, Lear hath ever but slenderly known himself. In other words, like a true narcissist, he hasn't really what? He hasn't done a self-examination. Okay. What's he do? He expects everybody out there to love him. He doesn't, <coughs> in the true sense, love himself. He loves what? The image of himself that everybody gives him. Like Richard II. That's why people listen to flatterers. What do the flatterers do? They don't hold the mirror up to nature. They hold the Rembrandt up to nature. They say, no, 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 no. This isn't how you look. You know, etch a sketch. Shake it. This is how you look. You look so much better than me. So, he hath ever slenderly known himself. Goneril, the best and soundest of his time, hath been but rash. It's almost like he's Oedipus reincarnated. The best and soundest. Lear has always been what? Your gloss says, you know, stormy and unpredictable. Well, he's always been rash. He's always been impetuous. He's always been impulsive. He's never thought through stuff. Then must we look from his age to receive not alone the imperfections of long and graft condition, but wherewithal the unruly waywardness the infirm and choleric years bring with them. In other words... Shoot. Man, are we screwed. Because if he's ever but hardly known himself, and he's always been rash, then now, as he starts to lose more of his faculties, how much more rash is he going to be? Reagan. Such a constant start, so we like to have from him as this of Ken's banishment. Notice she's implying. That wasn't a smart move. Okay. One, two. Edmund comes in. And where have we seen Edmund before? At the beginning of the play, when, God, when Gloucester and Kent come in, and he says, do you know this Lord? Speaking to Edmund, Edmund says, no. He introduces them. So now we hear Edmund himself. The little bit we were told about Edmund at the beginning was that he was what? A bastard. Okay. And how much is he loved by his father? Eh, the same as the legitimate son, which is not much. So now Edmund comes in. And he gets a soliloquy. Thou nature art my goddess. Nature. 
Why nature? To thy law my services are bound. Well, what is natural law? Is that what he's talking about? No, he's not. What's the law of nature? Even though they weren't aware of this language, you know, a biologist, 1859, wrote a little book. Charles Darwin, The Origin of the Survival of the, of the Fittest. You know, every year about this time, towards the end of December, you know, you'll see various memes on Facebook about Darwin Awards. That is, people who shouldn't have lived. And then they don't because they they become examples of Darwinism at work. He is saying he's going to be what? The fittest. I'm going to be the big fish in the small pond. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me for the time some 12 or 14 moonshines lag of a brother? What is the plague of custom? What is the curiosity of nations? Law. Law. He's saying custom has made the curiosity of nations into essentially a plague. Why? Well, what does the law say? Bastard child gets what? Zip. Why bastard? Not born in legitimate wedlock. Well, he's going to go on and talk about what's in the word legitimate. This goes way, way back. Um, two, essentially, I don't know that Shakespeare knows this. Aeschylus' Oresteia. Series of three plays, Agamemnon, um, Libation Bearers, the Eumenides, okay, where you get the transformation of culture or society from um, honor slash feud driven revenge to law driven. And in the middle of that, you have the characters, the Furies, the Harpies, the bird-like creatures with women's faces and beaks that hound you to death if you break some kind of natural law, like you shouldn't kill your mother. Okay? And she killed my dad, exactly, you know. You shouldn't kill your father either. You shouldn't kill your brother, you know. Why? That's not just don't murder. It's that whole revenge idea. If you kill your mother, who's going to get the revenge? Your sister or your brother of the same mother? How are they going to get the revenge? I killed you. You can't do that at all. Because you shouldn't kill people of your own family. It's okay to kill people who aren't in your family. Why? Because it's us and them. Okay? Very, very, very old idea. Right, right. But you can't get revenge blood feud within the family. That's the basic problem of the whole revenge culture. So, where was I? Um, in, in the Oresteia, you get this transformation from that kind of culture to laws, a trial by a court, a trial by a jury of one's peers, etc. So, he calls all that the curiosity of nations. Why bastard? Why base? When my dimensions are as well compact, that is, I look just like him. Same shape, same height. My mind is as generous, I think as well as he does. My shape as true, I'm not deformed. As honest, madam's issue. Why brand they us with base? Who's the us? Bastards unite, you know. And you gotta imagine, or at least I do, when Edmund comes out and does his speech, probably 25% of the groundlings are bastards. And so when he says, you know, why brand they us with base, with base, baseness? 
bastardy base base. You know, the bastards in the pit, in the yard, are all going, yeah! You know, bastards rise up, you know. We'll take on the real bastards, you know. Who in the lusty self of nature take more composition in fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale, tired bed got to the creating a whole tribe of fops got tween asleep and awake. In other words, all you fops, <clears throat> that is, you kind of ornate, prattling, courtier fools, you are all conceived because your mothers and fathers accidentally bumped into each other in the middle of the night, had a quickie, and then went back to sleep. While us bastards, oh, they enjoyed that. They knew what they were doing. <coughs> well then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. He's not saying I'm going to buy it from you. No, I'm going to take it from you. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate. True. Gloucester's in jerk, I'll say, at the beginning of the play. He doesn't show love to either of his sons. Fine word, legitimate. Well, my legitimate, if this letter speed and my invention thrive, then what? Then Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. Now, gods, stand up for bastards. And that's when, you know, the crowd all probably. And I imagine those up in the galleries are going, oh, my. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> so, Gloucester comes in. Kent banished thus. France in collar, what does that mean? Anger, parted. If you know anything about England and France, you don't want to get one pissed off at the other because you know, they've been going at it, hammer and tongs, even though they're relatively at peace now, for well over a thousand years. And the king gone tonight? He means gone literally. The king is left, but I think he means also, and the king has departed. <laughs> He's not quite with us. Kind of Hamlet, you know. The body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. All this done upon the gad, that is, instantly, without thinking. So, Edmund, how now? What news? He says, oh, none, and has this letter that he shoves into his pocket. What's that letter? No, oh, nothing, nothing. Not for you. No, not, not for you, Father. No, what needed then that terrible dispatch to put it in? Come on. See, Edmund is just doing what? He knows exactly which, which buttons to push. So that Gloucester is immediately, okay, doubtful. He's, what are you hiding? So he shows him the letter. It's a letter Edmund has written. Looks like it's Edgar's hand. And what's it suggest? Edgar's going to try to do what? Patricide? Take his father's lands? Right. So we have the great chain of being, and over here we have the king, his three daughters. Here we have Gloucester, his two sons. Okay, we can call him E or Ed, because they're both Ed Mund and Ed Gar. I can't remember what Ed means in Germanic. This is spear. This is like foundation of, but I don't remember what Ed. <coughs> Why did I put great chain of being up here? Keep in mind this is also <coughs> King Tate. Because in all three of these, the great chain of being is being ruptured. The king has ruptured it by attempting to divide it here. The king has ruptured it, how? In the family, because what's he done? Pit his daughters against each, other, against each other. He's disowned one. Yeah, that is anti-family. Those aren't family values. Okay. Against the state? What about over here? What do we see Edmund doing? 
He's pitting his brother against. Let's rephrase that. He's pitting Gloucester against his brother. Okay? By making Gloucester think his brother's trying to take his position. The whole idea of the great chain of being is being obliterated. Right? <coughs> so, Edmund, you know, lies a bit, explains how it came to him and such. And Gloucester says, top of page 1213. Line 77, O villain, villain, his very opinion in the letter, abhorred villain, unnatural, detested, brutish villain. Okay. Do you know where he is? He said, no, I don't. He goes, I, I don't think this is anything serious. You know. Gloucester, really? You don't think so? They talk a little bit. Pick up with 103. Edmund says, tell you what, Dad. I'll go try him out. I will seek him, sir, presently, convey the business as I shall find means, and acquaint you with all. I'll go question him, and I'll come back and tell you. Okay? Gloucester. These late eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us. Well, what did Glendower say eclipses in the sun and moon mean, especially in regards to his birth? It's auspicious. Okay? Eclipses always indicate what? There's something wrong with the great chain of being. Why? They don't appear to be natural. Because the natural, well, not much today, the natural duty face of the sun is what? Why? And it shines. And it does this every day. Eclipses seem to occur how? Haphazardly. Only if you know a bit of astronomy and a bit of physics do you come to realize eclipses happen how? Very regularly. You can predict them hundreds or thousands of years in advance. Okay? They didn't know that. So, eclipses of sun and moon Though the wisdom of nature can reason it thus and thus, yet nature finds itself scourged by the sequent effects. That is, when the sun is blocked and when the moon is blocked, that has repercussions down here. Why? The whole idea of the spheres. Here are some of the repercussions. Love cools. Friendship falls off. Brothers divide. Foreshadowing, which is in good foreshadowing and good dramatic irony, Gloucester's completely oblivious to the real import of his words. Brothers divide, in cities mutinies, in countries discord, in palaces treason. Notice, by the way, the word dis discord and somebody's name in the play. Palace is treason, the bond cracked, twixt son and father, this villain of mine, comes under the prediction. There's son against father. The king falls from bias of nature. There's father against child. We have seen the best of our time. That means the good old days were exactly that. The good old days. And everything since then, life and existence is becoming what? Worse and worse and worse and worse. As Robert Herrick puts it in To the Virgins to Make Much of Time, worse times succeed the former. Machinations, hollowness, treachery, and all ruinous disorders follow us disquietly to our grave. Maybe that informs us a little bit about why Lear says he wants to shake off the government so that he can crawl unburdened to his grave. Because machinations, plotting, hollowness, 
I love you, Dad. Treachery, Edmund plotting against his brother and father, and all ruinous disorders do what? They follow. That is, they're kind of pushing us on to our grave. Find this villain, Edmund. It shall lose thee nothing. Do it carefully. He leaves. So what has Gloucester just attributed all the ills of this world to? The stars and planets. And then we get Edmund, one of Shakespeare's great villains. This is the excellent foppery of the world. That when we are sick in fortune, that is, when we're on the right side of fortune's wheel and we're falling, Often the surfeits of our own behavior. That is, when we are sick in fortune, it's what? It's my fault. It's not because I'm a victim of somebody else. It's because of things I've done. Okay? We make guilty of our disasters, what? The sun, the moon, the stars. We make somebody else responsible. as if we were villains on necessity. On necessity, as if fate made me evil. Or as Flip Wilson used to put it in his old TV show back in the 70s, when he would just dress up as Geraldine, the devil made me do it. Okay? Because she was, you know, always saying, oh, I would never do this. It was always what? Somebody else put me up to it. See, that's an old, old dodge. How old? Go back to the beginning of the book of Genesis. The woman that you gave me. Meh, wrong answer. What does the woman that God gave Adam say? The serpent. Notice what both of them do. They pass the buck. Well, Harry Truman famously said what? The buck stops here. What is Edmund doing? Edmund's saying, I'm not a rotten bastard. Because of how I was born, because of the stars and planets at my birth or at my conception, because of the gods. No, he's going to say, I'm a rotten bastard because I like being a rotten bastard. It's more fun. He says, as if we were villains on necessity, Fools by heavenly compulsion, knaves, thieves, and treacherers by spherical predominance, drunkards, liars, and adulterers by an enforced, by an enforced obedience of planetary influence, and all that we are evil in by a divine thrusting on. Predestination. I am evil because John Calvin said total depravity. Uh-uh, Edmund says. An admirable evasion of whore master man. What does he mean, whore master? One to master whores. He's saying, no, no, no. That's an evasion because we're all rotten. Now, that could be the John Calvin part. We're rotten because we're rotten, period. We choose it. To lay his goatish disposition on the charge of a star. That is, a whore master man, a man who visits whores, would say, well, I'm this way. Why? Because I was born under the sign of Capricorn. Right? <coughs> December 24th to January... 20th, I believe. I'm on the 19th, so I'm Capricorn. That's why I'm the way I am. My father compounded with my mother under the dragon's tail, and my nativity was under Ursa Major, so it follows I am rough and lecherous. That's what fuck means, by the way. I should have been that I am. Had the maidly star in the firmament twinkled on my bastardizing. And Edgar comes in. Okay? Edgar says, Father's looking for you. 
tells him a little bit of what happened. Not that he's plotted against him. Okay. We're going to skip a bunch. And Edgar leaves. Okay. And Edmund says, a credulous father. What does credulous mean? We use this word maybe too much. It's not gullible. Because gullible means you'll believe anything. Clueless. Credulous. Louder? Clueless. No, not clueless. What's the first part? Cred. Like credo. I believe. It is a believing person. Someone who believes. Okay? Credulous means believes easily. Doesn't have to have a lot of proof. Gullible means you don't have to have any proof. <coughs> hey, I know how you can make a quick hundred grand. Turn over your bank account information to me, and I'm a Nigerian prince, and I will give you 20 million. Lost my place. A credulous father and a brother noble. Why is the noble important? whose nature is so far from doing harm that he suspects none. That's kind of Shakespeare's definition of noble. Someone who is so far from doing ill that he suspects what or expects what in other people? The same. He doesn't expect people to act poorly. He expects everybody else to act. Nobly. On whose foolish honesty my practices ride easy. <coughs> In other words, too easy. This is too easy for me. My father believes too easily. Why? Because he now believes his eldest son is out to get him. And my brother is so honorable and noble, he doesn't ever think that I would lie to him. I see the business. Let me, if not by birth, have lands by wit. All with me is meat that I can fashion it. Fashion fit. Now, we have a phrase that means almost exactly what he says there. All with me is meat that I can fashion fit. Your gloss. Justifiable. Fit to my purpose. The ends justify the means. What are the ends he wants? Daddy's land. What are the means? I'll kill my brother and father. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter how I get it. It's the end that's important. Okay. So we have um, uh, one three we can skip. Pick up with one four. Kent comes in disguised. And he says, line four. Now banish Kent, if thou canst serve, or thou dost stand condemned. So may it come, thy master whom thou lovest shall find thee full of labors. And I thought about that before, but man, that is a biblically loaded passage. So, what's he mean? You're banished. He's talking to himself. Okay. So, if you can serve where you stand condemned, that is, the land that he's supposed to leave, so may it come that thy master, who's his master? Lear. <coughs> that thy master, whom thou lovest, shall find thee full of labors. Well, where's his master? Physically, he's still here. Up here? Or, why I said biblically this is, you know, full of illusion possibly. Christ tells a couple of parables about these masters who have land and the master goes away on a journey. What does he do? He leaves the land to either a steward or a tenant, etc. And in both of them, what's the upshot? When the master returned, what's he went to find? That the steward is busy. I think Kent might be suggesting 
when he returns, that is, when Lear comes back to himself, when he returns in his right mind, he'll see what? I've been busy working for him. Okay? So, Lear comes in. And Lear asks, what art thou, a man? What dost thou profess? That is really, what, what, what do you do? What wouldst thou with us? What do you want with us? I do profess to be no less than I seem. To serve him truly, that will put me in trust. To love him that is honest. To converse with him that is wise. And says little. That And says little, that is one of the definitions he's saying of wisdom. It goes back to Polonius. To fear judgment, to fight when I cannot choose. Again, beware of quarrels, but if you're in one, and to eat no fish. What art thou? A very honest fellow. As poor as the king. <laughs> if you're as poor as he is, what would, again, what do you want? Service. Who wouldst thou serve? You. Dost thou know me, fellow? I could be really grasping at straws here. Line 26. I wonder if Shakespeare's punning on the word, the first word, dust. It means doest. But the pronunciation is exactly the same as D-U-S-T. That is, do you know I'm dust, fellow? Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Could be wrong. No, sir, but you have that in your countenance, which I would fain call master. Really, what's that? Authority. That is, Kent is saying, there's something about you that is commanding. So, Kent says what he can do, and he is um, united to Lear. Uh, Oswald comes in, and let's see. He trips up Oswald and such. We're going to skip a lot of that. Go to the bottom of page two, uh, 1215. When the fool speaks. Line 97. Just before, the fool offers Kent his hat. Okay? And Kent's like, why? <laughs> For taking one's part that's out of favor. Nay, and thou canst not smile as the wind sits. Thou catch cold shortly. There, take my costume. Why, this fellow has banished two of his daughters and did the third a blessing against his will. If thou follow him, thou must needs wear my coxcomb. In other words, if you're going to follow him, you better be a fool too. Now, the fool is telling us something about what's going to happen shortly. Okay? He's banished of, essentially, his two daughters. He banished his third daughter. What What is the fool kind of hinting at? Why is... There's another reason why Kent is going to need the fool's hat. Why do you wear a hat? No, it's not to hide your identity. You don't really need one today. Last week... Thursday, Wednesday, louder. Keep going. To keep warm. Why? Because you don't have one of these to come into. You don't have a room. You don't have a house. You don't have a roof over your head. So the hat serves as a roof over your head. I think, I could be wrong, that the fool is kind of alluding to Lear's not going to have a home pretty soon. You're going to want another hat there, Kent. Okay. So, they keep talking, page 1216. And the fool says, let me, let me teach you a speech, Lord. He's talking to Lear. And Lear says, go ahead. Mark it, Nuncle. Nuncle means uncle. Mark it means pay attention. Learn this. Have more than thou showest. Speak more than thou, uh, speak less than thou knowest. Lend less than thou owest, that is, own. Ride more than thou goest, that is, ride on horseback. 
more than you walk. Learn more than thou trowest. Sit less than thou throwest. Leave thy drink and thy whore and keep in a door. <coughs> leave thy drink and thy whore, that is, leave the tavern, stay at home. And thou shalt have more than two tens to a score. Yeah, this is nothing, fool. Kent means, well, this is st stupid. This doesn't mean anything. Really? It is like the breath of an unfeed lawyer. That is, an unpaid lawyer. You gave me nothing for it. Right? Free advice is worth what? What you pay for it. Okay? And yet, everything the fool has just said harkens back to, is similar to, the stuff that Polonius said. Okay. Is it wisdom? I kind of think it is. Why? It's hinting at some of the things that are going to happen to Lear. So they keep talking. And the fool says, oh, let me tell you another one. Lear, go ahead. The Lord that counseled thee to give away thy land, make him come here and sit by me. And do thou for him stand. That is, you pretend to be the Lord that counseled you to give up your land. The sweet and bitter fool will presently appear. What's the fool just said? You damn fool. Notice, he's standing for, representing the person that gave him advice. Well, who gave Lear that advice? Lear did. It was his own idea. The one in Motley here, the other found out there. That is, I'm a fool, everybody knows. Why? Because I wear the clothing of a fool. You're not supposed to be a fool. Dost thou call me fool boy? All the other titles thou hast given away, thou, that thou was born with. What do you mean? How was he born with that? He was born foolish. It's his nature. How do you dispense with foolishness? Learning, gathering wisdom. All right. So they go on. And the fool talks about how he's essentially divided himself in two. That's the whole thing about the cut the egg in the middle, eat up the meat. And what do you have? You have the two crowns of the egg. That is one half of an eggshell, the other half of the eggshell. When thou clovest thy crown in the middle and gavest away both parts, goneral, Reagan, thou borest thine ass in thy back, way over the dirt. In other words, what did you leave for yourself, Lear? Nothing. He divided the kingdom in two. Why didn't he divide it in three and leave a little bit for himself? Because where does he have to stay now? With his daughters. Might as well, you know, to channel Tennessee Williams, trust the kindness of strangers as trust his daughters. So, Lear kind of says, you keep going like this, I'm going to have you whipped. <coughs> 179, the fool. I marvel what kin thou and thy daughters are. I marvel, I wonder at, I'm amazed at. They'll have me whipped for speaking true, thou'll have me whipped for lying. And sometimes I am whipped for holding my peace. I'd rather be any kind of king, any kind of thing, than a fool. And yet I would not be thee, knuckle. Thou hast paired thy wit of both sides. Paired, like, you know, when you pair an apple or pair a, a potato, you peel it. Well, what happens if you keep peeling? You end up with nothing. Thou hast paired thy wits of both sides and left nothing in the middle. Ooh, here comes one of the pairings. And then walks Donald. And we get Lear's first indication of how greatly Goneril loves her dear father. What does she come to talk to him about? What is she telling him in lines 198 and following? Your knights are a bunch of what? 
drunken revelers. She says, they do hourly carp and quarrel, breaking forth in rank and not to be endured riots. So I, I thought to make this well known to you, to have found a safe redress, but now I grow fearful by what yourself too late have spoken done, that you protect this course and put it on by your allowance. That is, and you allow them to. You don't stop them. Okay? So, she's essentially going to say, we're going to, I'm going to allude to something much greater. No, you don't get to have 100 plus nights. So, she says all this in the air. Are you our daughter? 217. I would you would make use of your good wisdom, whereof I know you were fraught, and put away these dispositions which of late transport you from what you rightly are. Hello, father. Now, I think she means here, stop it. I know you're acting crazy. Lear, does anyone here know me? This is not Lear. Does Lear walk thus, speak thus? Where are his eyes? Who is it that can tell me who I am? Fool, Lear's shadow. Why? Because if there's a shadow, then what must there be? There must be the real Lear. I would learn that. Meaning, I would study that. That is, there's something deep there, but whoosh. For by the marks of sovereignty, knowledge, and reason, I should be false persuaded I had daughters. If I really had daughters, he is saying, what about Gomorrah? You wouldn't be talking to me this way. Yeah. You you were all about love before. Disadmiration, sir, is much of the savior savor of your new pranks. That is, stop acting crazy. It's a prank, I get it. But as you are old and reverend, 237, should be wise. Let's go back to my earlier diagnosis and say that Lear suffers from Alzheimer's. If that's the case, what is Goneril showing? Can't, can't be Alzheimer's. It's got to be. He's, he's got to be acting. Why? I never, again, I literally never thought about it before. But, I mean, the play could be ran entirely through that lens. Yeah. Could part of that thought be because, the, uh, and I may be kind of misconception, but that the king was ordained by God and at that point just had to do what happened to him? Possible. Um, but, as we'll see in the play, it's not very clear that Goneril and Reagan really care much for the gods. That is, they're kind of like, yeah, screw them. <coughs> We're going to get what we want down here. And usually what that means is the gods are going to, you know, you're going to teach them a lesson or two. Okay. So she says, um, <coughs> line 246, you, you're going to go to your, you're going to go to my sister's. And she begs, now line 246, a little to disquantity your train. What does she mean, to disquantity your train? And the remainders that shall still depend to be such men as may besort your age. That is, you got to get rid of a bunch of your knights. And those that remain have to do what? Okay, line 248, be short, be fit your, you don't need a bunch of young 20-year-olds, hormones raging, no, 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 you need a bunch of older knights, a bunch of guys in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, yes, Lord, what can I help you with? Why? Because they won't be drinking and carousing, etc. Lear. I'm out of here. I'm not going to. Okay. So, Albany tells him, be patient. <laughs> My men, 262, 
My train are men of choice and rarest parts. All particulars of duty know. That is, they know how to behave, etc. How ugly didst thou in Cordelia show. What's the thou? Oh, most small fault. Well, Goneril's not showing me proper love. And Lear does this, 249, 269. Lear, Lear, Lear! Beat at this gate and starts hitting himself in the head. That let thy folly in and thy dear judgment out. I'm becoming even more convinced that my reading is correct. What's he mean? What is Lear real? Okay, I think that's metaphorically possible, but I think there's something even much more basic. Because it is mutual of Alzheimer's or whatever, that comes with early onset dementia, but it comes in pieces. So he would have moments of clarity, but like, oh, I'm still there. And he is crystal clear aware. He knows exactly what's happening. He beats himself in the head. Why? Kind of like Kent, when Kent earlier addressed him, calls him fool and old man. Why? Kent's trying to shake him. What can you, if you've never had an experience, one, I hope you never do, <laughs> you can't argue with someone with either early onset dementia or Alzheimer's. Why? Because the arguing faculty is gone. So Lear says, he beats at his head, that what? He says, that let thy folly in and by thy dear and thy dear judgment out. It's, that's Lear going, what is happening to me? I can't think straight anymore. The hardest thing, you know, for my siblings and I and my dad with my mom was when she was perfectly clear aware and would say things like, I know my memory is not as good. I'm not remembering, and I'm sorry. And then would repeat, repeat the same story five times right after. Okay? And then would have a moment. I just said it again, didn't I? That's what Lear is going through here. Okay, we will stop there. Where did I put my little thing in? Um, let's even though we haven't discussed it yet. Let's plan on a quiz over the first three acts of Lear for the Tuesday when we get back. And we're not going to talk about it, um, Tempest. We're not going to get to it. So we'll just finish Lear. Um, I have a question. Do you yeah. want me to just email you my packet? Or do you want me to just go ahead and ask you right now? You can ask me right now. Um, so I wanted to do one of you with this I wanted to kind of take the representations of the chaos and law and kind of how it's a driving point of the story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be good. Have a good Thanksgiving. Yep. Watch or read.